What is happening, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back to offer a spoiler-free review for The Creator, which I saw in IMAX tonight. And going into this, I had like my fingers crossed. I was praying to baby Jesus, and I was sacrificing a bull, a bull to Zeus. I was basically doing everything in my power to try and will this into being like the best goddamn science fiction flick that we've seen in recent memory. Because if original science fiction films not based on pre-existing IP can do well, well then guess what? We will see more original science fiction films. I grew up in the 80s and nine, in the 90s where we had a lot of original science fiction films. So I miss seeing new sci-fi flicks on a regular basis. So it fills me with dismay to report that I was not that into the flick. I think it starts really strong and then just the air slowly goes out of the balloon. And by the end of the movie, I was frankly bewildered by what I was watching because the quality of like the final third, I mean, it just falls off a cliff relative to where the movie begins. And in the past, I've fallen into the trap where you want something to be good so desperately that you kind of willfully blind yourself to whatever the flaws of the film might be. But I'm not going to fall into that trap here because it was just such a snooze fest overall. And these are hard movies to review sometimes because when a movie's terrible, you can just call attention to all of its uh, shortcomings and all of its failings, and then you can wrap up your review and you're done. And when a movie's incredible, well, you don't even really have to review it. You just rant and rave about all the things that you love. But when a movie's kind of okay or kind of mediocre and then just, like I said, just kind of slowly fades and dissolves into nothing, that gets much more difficult to kind of like assess where things went wrong. But as I was watching it, here's my theory. I suspect that the original running time of this film was much longer than two hours and 13 minutes. And it feels a little long as is, but it starts to feel like it's rushing in the final third, almost like giant chunks of the film are missing because suddenly emotional scenes that should land or should have like a big emotional payoff feel like they, they ring a little hollow or they feel incomplete. And I bet the original cut of this film was probably like two hours and 45 minutes. And the studio involved, I don't know which studio made this, but whoever was responsible for financing this probably said, you got to shave 30 minutes off this movie. We don't care where you cut it, but you got to cut 30 minutes out of this because people are going to fall asleep. And once again, that is pure speculation on my part, but I don't think I'm going to be alone in feeling that way because I saw one person or heard one person snoring in the row right in front of me. And there was an entire row of people that got up and left the movie about halfway through. And I did not mind seeing them go because because they sat down and it was a, a row of people. Not only were they talking incessantly, they're the kind of people that were showing each other videos with audio once the movie had started. And when I looked over them and told them to turn their phone off, they looked at me like I had six heads, like how dare I spoil their fun by telling them to turn their phone off. So I was kind of just like, I was holding my hand up so I wouldn't see the glow of their phone as I was watching because I didn't feel like having yet another temper tantrum. And then at a certain point, one got up and hauled ass, another got up and hauled ass, and then they all left. I was like, all right, don't let the doorknob hit you or the good Lord split you. But if I'm being honest, no matter how obnoxious I found their behavior to be, I was kind of jealous that they were leaving. I wanted to leave. I considered leaving, but I've agreed in advance to do a podcast on Saturday on Wrong Reel about the creator as well as the 1985 film Creator. So I was like, fuck, I'm trapped. Like, I can't leave. I have to not only watch the movie, I have to pay attention because I have to be able to discuss it with another human being on Saturday. So like it or not, I had to sit there and in my mind take notes. I never actually physically take notes while watching a movie because I feel like the best way you're going to kind of understand if a movie's working or not is if you, if you really let it like kind of pour through your eyeballs and really just wash over you. You got to get immersed in it. You have to forget that you're reviewing it and just try to experience it as a viewer. But I'm getting ahead of myself and I haven't even mentioned yet what the hell this movie's about or who made it. So here is the, uh, the premise from IMDb. Against the backdrop of a war between humans and robots with artificial intelligence, a former soldier finds the secret weapon, a robot in the form of a young child. And the movie is directed by Gareth Edwards and it was written by Gareth Edwards and Chris Weitz. And Gareth Edwards, he has a lot of fans out there. Like, he did the 2014 version of Godzilla. I thought that movie kind of sucked, but at least it was watchable. And he was the original director on Rogue One, a Star Wars story, before he got replaced. I don't know if it was justified or not justified that he got replaced, but if you like Rogue One, chances are Gareth Edwards played a role and some of its uh, assets or some of the uh, the ingredients that you found to be interesting. And also as a director, I've never seen his 2010 film Monsters, but I'm aware that that movie does have its fans. So if I'm overlooking a kick-ass flick, I apologize. But it, yeah, I just haven't had a chance to go back and watch Monsters from 2010. But I know some people do like it. 
And if I wanted to pretend as if I enjoyed the movie more than I did, here are some of the stronger ingredients that I would call attention to. I think it has a very solid opening. I'm not going to claim it's like on the level of fucking Blade Runner or The Matrix or Robocop or any other sci-fi flick you care to mention, but it does have a decent premise. I love the idea of humans versus AI, and obviously that topic's been explored by many movies, many books. It's nothing new, so as we got into it, I was like, all right, what is going to be your new point of view or your new perspective that allows us to discuss AI in a more nuanced, more sophisticated way? Because obviously the subject of AI is not going away anytime soon. We just saw a giant writer strike draw to a close where one of the main sources of contention was the subject of AI, how it will be employed, when it will be employed, who will it be employed by, like how is it going to be part of the creative process, if at all? And I think we're going to continue to discuss it, debate it, rip it apart, put it back together, trying to figure out, like, are we the tool of AI or is AI our tool? Or are we going to find a way to kind of work in harmony with one another moving forward? And I have no real strong predictions apart from just saying if they continue to give us opening credit sequences like we saw in Secret Invasion, which was designed by AI, I think people will sour on AI really quickly. But it's all about... The execution, I guess I'm waiting for the day where I see a painting or read a book or hear a piece of music created by AI where I can't tell the difference between the hand of a human of a human artist versus an artificial one, but I don't think we're anywhere close to that yet. Like I said, I think AI is a good tool in the creative process, but it is not the final destination. In any event, this movie begins a few years after open hostilities have begun between humans and AI, and we're basically like in a dystopian, futuristic hellscape with perpetual warfare, perpetual violence, and humans are slowly but surely getting the upper hand, and John David Washington plays a character who's kind of embedded or living living in secret amongst people who are sympathetic to AI or like are trying to find a way to live in harmony with AI. And I have to be careful about which details I include or which details I discuss and which ones I don't, but as you've seen in the trailer, the character played by John David Washington, he eventually comes face to face with this secret weapon that's been designed by the AI. It's a little girl. And this little girl, while her powers are minimal right now, as she gets older and continues to evolve, she will have incredible powers over all the technology around her. And right now, like she can like turn TVs and computers off and on by thinking about it. But the the big secret weapon for humanity, which you see in the trailer, is this immense ship floating in space. I think it's called Nomad. But what Nomad has the ability to do is basically scan environments, fire out a bunch of missiles, take out all the AI and robots, and then move on. And slowly but surely, humans are winning the war. But if AI is going to win, it will be through the help of the character played by Madeline Una Voiles. And then for the rest of the movie, John David Washington finds himself in a conflicted situation where he's loyal to a degree to the human cause and see things from their point of view, but at the same time, he feels compelled to protect this girl and guide her to safety, and he has his own reasons as to why he's doing it. You'll have to see the movie to find out why. But over time, as they're traveling together and getting into like you know one situation after another and having to fight their way out of it, they form like a father-daughter bond, and they become very close. And initially, I'll admit, I was kind of into it. I wasn't in love with it, but I was going along for the ride. I was like, all right, this is pretty good. I can I can stick with this. They had some interesting uh, needle drops by people like Radiohead. And I just like the overall look of this dystopian world. But where the movie starts falling to pieces is that it's trying to have a message and it's trying to have a form of propaganda but it feels like the, the filmmakers and the writers, they don't quite know what they want that propaganda or message to be. And what hurts it even more is that they deliver it in a clumsy fashion. And as I mentioned before, as we get closer and closer to the ending, it feels increasingly like more and more chunks have been removed from the movie. So it's like, what are you trying to say? I'm not quite sure I'm getting... Uh, what you're driving toward and adding to this confusion or to these mixed signals is the fact that I think this movie might have the least compelling or the least persuasive or just the least interesting portrayal of AI that I've ever seen in a movie. It seems like from the uh, from the filmmaker's point of view, all AI aspires to be is like simple peasant people living in bamboo villages, almost like people did hundreds of years ago. I'm like, they're AI, the robots. They don't need to sleep. They don't sit around playing cards and like having a few beers at the end of the day. Like the portrayal of AI in this and the way robots live and the way they talk. From the point of view of this movie, AI got to the point where they built rudimentary humanoid like figures and they said, all right, I guess we're done. Like that's this is just the way AI is going to be moving forward. And I'd be like, well, AI can be like totally online or it can be in the form of like a, a sphere floating in the air or it could be a vast spaceship floating up in space. It can be in any, sh any shape or any form you could possibly imagine. But nope, throughout this entire movie, every form of AI is just these kind of rudimentary 
primitive, kind of simple people. And I think that was a huge creative misstep on the part of the filmmakers, reducing AI to this overly simplistic way of life, which I think no matter what your predictions about what AI is going to turn into, nobody's predicting that AI is going to result in people living in bamboo villages like fishermen from a thousand years ago. I just found that to be absolutely fucking ridiculous. And as a result, this movie fails creatively in one of the most important aspects where a movie needs to succeed, the smell test. And what do I mean by the smell test? Like you could watch an implausible movie, you can watch an unrealistic movie, but as long as you buy the overall vision of like the world they're creating and the rules that they've set up for themselves, well then you'll kind of follow them wherever they go. Like, do the rules of Star Wars make perfect sense? Like, no, but you buy the rules in the context of the overall fictional setting, or at least I did once upon a time or the Terminator franchise, the first two movies. You buy the story, you buy the setting, you get completely invested, and so then you can enjoy the emotions of the story because you find the setting to be plausible, to be believable, or even in the fucking Matrix. Even as they're you know running up walls and having martial arts contests and that sort of thing, you buy it, you believe it, because they have a, they have a plausible explanation as to why this world developed the way that it did. And with this movie, I feel like it's a giant step backwards for the uh, the sci-fi genre overall because I didn't really buy it or believe any of it, and I found it increasingly difficult to buy into it or believe it as we see more of the world as the movie unfolds. Honestly, it's just a giant fucking snooze fest overall, and I think it's a huge missed opportunity because you have a good director, you have a good male lead, and I feel a little sorry for John David Washington because he keeps trying to get set up in these giant kind of blockbuster movies, and a lot of them keep underperforming. I mean, uh, Amsterdam last year was one of the most costly and one of the most embarrassing creative disasters of last year, and now with this... I think there'll be some people who either like it or talk themselves into liking it, but it's not going to be some runaway smash, uh, you know, sci-fi sensation. And I know some people will try to convince themselves that they liked it more than they actually did because I heard that kind of limp, half-hearted applause at the end from like four or five people, like the kind of people who clap after every movie they see, no matter whether or not the movie's good or bad. They just love going to the movies. And so this movie, it will pass the time if you feel like sitting there for two hours and 15 minutes, but the trailer hinted at or suggested a movie that's much better than we actually see. And all the best scenes from the trailer come from like the first 20, 30 minutes of the movie. Like I said, the movie starts off okay, and then it just kind of slowly but surely just dissolves through, through osmosis into the ether and becomes a pretty, uh, pretty boring piece of film to watch. Because in the end, no matter what kind of movie we're watching, whether it's science fiction or a drama or a comedy or a historical epic or just like an experimental you know, exercise, people like screaming at each other in, uh, in black and white or whatever the case may be, like no matter what, there are a million different ways you can tell a story on the big screen. But in the end, what we're looking for is a heightened sense of experience. We're looking for emotion, and you can generate emotion in so many different ways, but if you don't find a way to kind of like get the audience, like hold them in your hands and carry them on an emotional journey, in the end, they're just gonna get fucking bored. And like I said, all these soaring emotional beats that the film is like visibly straining to reach at the end through the music or people crying or people screaming, they all, for me at least, they all rang hollow. I feel like none of those emotions rang true. And I just couldn't believe that I was stuck there for the entire duration of the film because I wanted to leave early on. Once again, I'm very jealous of those annoying people who wouldn't get off their phones. But who knows? Maybe I'm just being the world's biggest asshole. Maybe I'm being a Debbie Downer. Maybe there are people out there who love uh, Gemma Chan. Or is it Gemma or Gemma? I think it's Gemma Chan. Or Ken Watanabe or Allison Jan. I mean, they, they assembled an incredible cast. It, I feel like the cast is doing everything in their power to kind of lift the scenes and invest those scenes with, with as much emotion as possible. But in a sci-fi movie, especially a sci-fi movie, exploring a subject as topical as AI you got to bring your A game and give us something fresh, something exciting, something that we can discuss. And I think people are going to walk away from this movie just kind of scratching their heads like, I guess the moral of the story is that we just need to accept it and let AI kind of conquer the world. Like, is that the moral of the story? And I think people will be debating like, what stupid, simplistic moral of the story is there? Because I'm not entirely sure that the writers of the filmmakers even could properly verbally articulate what they intended it to be, or as someone just got lost in translation through studio interference or through the shortcomings of their own filmmaking technique, but something got lost in the process. And in the end, the movie just ends up being an overall 
unsatisfying experience. It's not a bad movie. It's I mean, it's impressively made. It's impressively produced. But if you don't have emotion, like I'd rather watch a $1 million movie with a lot of emotion than a $200 million movie with none. And I'm sorry, having the occasional scene where the five-year-old AI robot girl says something inappropriate so that we can all laugh at a small child saying an F-bomb or shit or whatever the case might be, that does not cut it. That is cute. And for me, the definition of cute is when a movie is using a shortcut to get to an emotion that the movie has not earned in, or in an organic fashion through the story. They're basically cheating, trying to get like a, a nervous chuckle from the audience because they're unable to get the audience to that place through their own devices. And so yeah, I loathe cuteness in all movies. And this movie falls into the trap of trying to be cute on more than one occasion. So yeah, the more I talk about it, the less I like it. So I think I better just go ahead and wrap up this review. I hope my negativity has not been too off-putting. I always worry about coming across like the world's biggest prick when explaining why I didn't like a movie, but it's hard to articulate why you don't like something without coming across as unlikable. So if you love the movie, please share your opinion down below. I don't expect everybody to think precisely how I do about individual shows and movies. I feel like discussions over the pros and cons of movies, that's where discussing movies get fun. If we all agree, well then there'd be no point in discussing movies in the first place. So if you violently agree with me, let me know on Twitter at Colbrax or let me know in the comments below. Uh, I can take it. I promise you I've got thick skin. And if you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to the channel, liking the video, hitting that notification bell. I would greatly appreciate it. But I hope everybody has a great weekend at the movies, but more importantly as always, onwards and upwards.